Hi, everyone. Welcome back. I'll just give another minute or so um, just to just to let some more people join us. And the only way I know is that there's there's enough cameras on. So I'm just going to take a guess and see if most people are back. <laughs> um, but we'll get started in a minute. Okay, I think we could go. I've been yeah. asked to extend my or extend apologies from Sahar Shah, who can't make it today. Um, she's sick at the moment, but she has sent in a YouTube recording of her talk, so we'll still be able to listen to it, and she'll accept any questions by email afterwards. Um, but that leaves us with our two speakers. But I'm going to hand over to Sahar, the other Sahar. Um, <laughs> um, so good afternoon, welcome everyone. Welcome to the second panel of Out of Bounds. Shifting Sands, Identity, Indigeneity, and Justice. Um, just as a housekeeping, I have a fan on here next to me because it's very warm. So if it disrupts the sound, if it bothers you, at any point I'm on unmute, please do tell me. I will tolerate the heat for all of you and I will switch it off. Um, so do let me know. Um, but okay, wonderful. We have um, three really interesting papers to discuss today. Um, I've personally been looking forward to this for days. So without uh, giving, making, wasting any more time and having you listen to me, um, I'd like to introduce our first speaker of the day, Soshavan Das. So Soshavan is, uh, has just completed his MA in English from Jadavur, you know, Jadavpur University in India, uh, just very recently in 2020, and is currently preparing for his PhD. Good luck. A graduate of Mulana Azad College, his research interests include post-colonial studies, migration, war, and critical refugee studies, diaspora studies, trauma, and memory studies. So really light stuff, you know, just very pleasant. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'll, ha I'll leave the floor open to you, Sushavan, so whenever you're ready. Yes, I hope I'm audible. Uh... First, thank you very much for having me here today. And uh, thank you very much to uh, Tom and Alicia for organizing this thing so smoothly. So I will be presenting my screen first. Uh, okay, I hope uh, the screen is like everyone can see the screen. So I will be beginning. Yep, yeah, that's fine. We can see it. So, I am but atoms of old passengers beneath to my cloistered bones, Write, writes my the Wong in her poem, Another Heaven. Wong's old passengers include her family, but also the people from her community. Her Wong ancestors, whom she never met because she was born after her parents' migration from the war-torn Laos to the US. This is, there is a crossing of borders happening here, a breaching, a transgression, if only in imagination. The passengers are the people in Laos, of Laos. Wang, on the other hand, is in the US and of the US. We can ask ourselves, is there an ethics here? I promise we will this question at the end of the paper. The poem, poets that I'm interested in, namely Ocean Wang, Fatemaskar, Safia Leila, and Maider Ma, Wang, are all children of immigrants. Wang is a Vietnamese American poet whose parents migrated to Connecticut when he was two years old. Uh, Askar is the daughter of a Muslim couple who were forced to relocate to the U.S. after partition, the partition of India. Uh, El Hilu is Sudanese American and Wong, as already noted, is a Hmong American poet. What is unique to all these poets is how they talk about certain experiences they could not have witnessed firsthand. In Wong, we see Saigon falling at the peak of Vietnam War amid a carnage of lives as a nun comes a place to the streets square. While in another poem, the poet's parents are seen making the precarious journey we are seeing that earned the Vietnamese refugees the title Boat People. In Asgur, the partition of India emerges in vivid details. In one of the many poems titled Partition, a woman is seen performing the bulbul for a stranger lying on the street, the ritual custom of washing the body of a close family member before burial. Assuming the woman's perspective momentarily, Asgur writes, 
every dead woman lords into another neat she could be my sister she says as her own sister never returns home in el hello the dramatic history of sudan raises its head in references of despotic violence the title of a collection the january children for instance is a reference to the generation born in sudan under british occupation all given the birth date january 1 and meet with the collection we learn about the ban on secular music the beating of a violinist and the military violence in a restaurant in khartoum finally in wrong we met we, we are met with the brutalities of a secret war in one poem the mekong river is seen flooded with bodies both dying and dead and in another a woman hiding from enemy soldiers is forced to kill her own child when it threatens to break a cry lest she may be discovered What is unique to all these images that we see in these poets are their felt intensity, unfolding movements that capture them in minds and embodied details. Now, one way to account for this felt intensity is to take recourse to Marion Hirsch's concept of post memory. For Hirsch, post memory is a way of accounting for the transmission of narratives in cases where the immediate link to the past is lost due to traumatic interruption, exile, and diaspora. As she explains. When children grow up in the presence of overwhelming narratives of their parents' traumatic experiences that precede their own birth or consciousness, they come to inherit them so deeply and effectively, so as to construct memories out of them and in their own right. For Hirsch, the primary structure of transmission is the family, and indeed, many of our poets tell us about this familiar experience. But there are limitations to the familiar structure, as in the case of Oscar, who was orphaned at a very young age. Here we can move on to the other mode of transmission identified by Hirsch, namely the affiliative mode. Affiliative post memory, according to Hirsch, includes acts of identification where resources found in the personal and or or public archives. Interestingly, affiliative post memory helps us to think of Alison Lansford's concept of prosthetic memory, that is, memories we take up prosthetic. Prosthetic memories, Landsberg argues, are those not strictly derived from a person's lived experience. They circulate publicly, and although they are not organically based, they are nevertheless experienced by the person's body as a result of an engagement with a wide range of cultural technology. Our age, it hardly needs iteration. It is the age of globalization, and one of its most interesting features is the electronic mode of circulation, what Arjuna Padurai calls electronic mediation. Electronic mediation comes in different forms, including the television, films, e-books. But one of its most interesting forms, no doubt, is the internet, where most of the other forms also circulate. The internet is page play. As a medium of circulation, it dispenses us with a diverse set of information resources at a single click. Sources that include e-journals and online archives, as well as those collated through private connections, drive links, and mail threads. Sources that may contain censored or suppressed material, and sources that may well foster prosperity. The internet, internet is not immune to hatred and duplicity, for globalization has its darker sides. Yet, what is interesting is that in functioning under the capacity of circulation, the internet can connect us across space and time. Offer us the comfort of a community in the absence of an immediate one, and even provide us with the authentic account of an incident when the news media denies doing the same. Today, for instance, there are online pages, what Yen Les Ritu has called moving memorials, that archive cultural histories and offer alternative meeting places for people belonging to marginalized communities and diasporas to bond, transmit memories, forge cultural identities, and narrate and re-narrate histories in the absence of a recognized one. We may now try to uh, we may now try to think of internet in relation to the idea of borders and boundaries. National borders are a way of ordering and organizing organization uh, that leads a recognizable category of people, the citizen, through a set of rituals and practices that yields what Michel Foucault would call a body of knowledge. Categorization is essential to our being, and categorization, like the rituals and practices it bases itself upon. Is more often than not corporeal and embodied. To categorize is to blunt the edges of what that which cannot be, uh, which does not fit, but can be brought under the category. To categorize is to bring the desperate into the unit, and so the nation becomes recognizable, becomes imaginable as a community in homogeneous time. The nation is an anony, autonomous, compact unit, a categorized and categorizable entity, albeit with subcategories. And whatever does not fit must be further categorized as the other. 
and we hardly need to repeat that the other is the one against whom the self is recognized. The other can be rejected or they can be allowed in on a temporary basis, but to prolong this visit, they must let themselves be fitted into the subcategory. No matter how much a country falls into the melting pot of cultures in the land of immigrants, as long as it has a country, it is a country and a nation, it will categorize the dominant relation to the minority, distort history and memory, make some amount of acculturation necessary. And we don't need to go far in search of evidence for this. The fact that today people are coming together to demand justice and equality, recognition, reparation, is proof enough that these things are lacking in the first place. Now, based on what I have discussed, it is not hard to imagine how the forces of globalization, the electronic modes of mediation and circulation disrupt the idea of borders. Borders live it and deal with it. They distinguish the inside from the outside, the our people and we from the they and them. But electronic mediation hardly obeys such rules. What is known, as Apadwar tells us, they control and propel our imagination, leading us to partake in acts of self-making, which are related to identity, that are not always in tandem with the demands of the country or the nation we are in. It is in this sense that I want to argue that the world is already in some sense post-national. Countries, nations, and nation states can choose to restrict the other, build walls or close their gates against those coming from the outside, but for all this, a border and along with it a whole regime of rules, regulations, and practices that the, that the border would uphold must exist, for, must exist for the borders that enable these acts in the first place. And yet, when people strive to access histories that are forgotten and disremembered by countries and nations for nationalistic or propagandist reasons, when they engage in discourses and discussions that are counter public and counter hegemonic in orientation, form bonds, survive cultures, and build solidarities and affiliations with people across space and time, people they should not remember. We must realize that they have already compromised the autonomy, the so called autonomy of the nation, the national body, violate the so called sanctity of its borders. All the poets that I talked about, I'm talking about today, do, do this either consciously or unconsciously. And yet, since all these practices are performed in the very space of a national body that the border guards, they are also within the national, the nation. It is in this respect that the world is post-national, not because the nation is post, but because the ethics and politics of certain acts performed within its space undo the very principles of its conceptual framework. I would now like to substantiate my argument with your examples from the poets. The first comes from Wang. In the many poems in his collection, Night Sky and Exit Poems, Wong patiently fills out the traumatic experiences of his family during and post the Vietnam War, the loss of life, land, and belongings, the journey to America, and the subsequent life in the host country of the racially stigmatized other. Scholars and artists like Yen Le, Spritchu, and Viet Thien Nguyen have shown us that the Vietnam War, for many of its complexities, is not a comfortable topic for the American imagination that was forced to create the twin myth of the US as the rescuer of the war afflicted Vietnamese from an oppressive communist regime and the Vietnamese as the food refugee, the model minority to hide its own failure and war crimes, acts that necessarily includes the distortion of memory. Writing about individual experiences for a war is, as Wong notes in a poem called Daily Bread, touching his people back from extinction. But in the context of the American imagination of the Vietnam War, it is also undeniably a political act, an act that violates the imagination, this imagination, and challenges the cultural amnesia practices. My second example is from Banks' poem, Dear Soldier of the Secret War. This poem unfolds in a serial monologue where Wang imagines, his, um, imagines asking a set of questions to a secret war soldier. In the course of these questions, Wang documents the brutalities committed by the Bhattu Lao, the communist political organization, against the allies of the U.S., of which this soldier is a part. His wife is dragged, uh, dragged naked, screaming, bleeding into the forest shadows. His son dashed to the rice pounder. His brother mutilated and the whole of his mom village turned to a graveyard. Towards the end of the poem, she asks him, What grief song erupts when you see the last American plane take off, distant ever long chain, reminding us of the U.S. abandonment of among allies? If we are careful, we would notice two things here. Firstly, the imagination has already transcended the familiar sphere to forge bonds of affiliation with the larger community. Secondly, in recalling the U.S. abandonment, the poem asks for accountability. 
an accounted detail to sense is heightened when the poem's final lines that recount the among soldiers' sense of mutual his own voice. All of our thousands who died on your side, why won't you authorize another plane? The voice echoes. Both these examples are across space and time, and if one is still within the purview of the family and his lineage, the other has already entered into the largest sphere of community. We find similar echoes in El Hilo, who imagines a romance with the legendary 20th century sing Egyptian singer Abdul Halim Hafiz and uses music as a metaphor to chart space and time and history, fortune, being, and belonging. These are ethical and political lacks of memory, what Sue Campbell would call memory activity, and they complicate our ideas of borders and boundaries precisely because these enunciations do not obey the laws that their lo fi demand of them. And yet, I want to ask, in forging these solidarities, can we transcend the group, the community, the diaspora of people known and not known, but bound together by common pull, by what Stephen Dufo calls the referent origin, or by the referential networks produced by the dispersal? Asghar, uh, Fatima Asghar's orphan status, as mentioned already, gave her a very unusual upbringing that didn't enable her to experience a space of familiar transmission. Interestingly, Asper also identifies as queer, something that stands more or less with odds, uh, odds with the Muslim community diaspora or indeed with any diaspora. And yet, one finds a collection, if they come for us, stewed with images of being and belonging. In a poem titled Shadi, literally marriage, for instance, Asper imagines the fate of women who do not, who have no agency of their own. These women are told their vote, told that they vote no more than the cattle jewelry or their bodies, and their identity solely rest in the negational addresses of you, Batamis, and Hor. Who are these women, we may ask? And Asper gives us a cue in the head note that refers to the widespread abduction and rape of women during partition. If we recognize these abductions across borders as also dispersions, we can see that Asper is building affiliations across space and time to the women of a diaspora, women dispersed during the partition. But these women do not, uh, these women bear no religious or cultural markers to categorize themselves as Muslim. And during partition, women of all religion, Muslim, Hindu, Sikh, were abducted by men of their own community, of the other community, or sometimes of their own community. Who are these women? Perhaps we can still categorize them as South Asian, in which we can refer to the South Asian diaspora. But South Asian diaspora, but the South Asian, the South Asian is as vast a category as there are communities and histories in South Asia. The noun here is quasi proper and already on the way to become a common noun. Regardless of theoretical complexities, for the self, diaspora is a way of forging belonging, and belonging is mostly entrenched the longing for a community. Commenting on the importance of community in her life, Asper has observed in an interview I think South Asian people are my people. Muslim people are my people. I think queer people of color are my people. In her collection, we encounter this community time and again in the images of people who are Muslim and Sikh, South Asian and even Jamaican, and sometimes simply men and women, queer people and people of color. In this sense, they do not belong from one particular community or group. What defines them is that they are all scattered from the places of belonging. There is a sense of precarity in them or otherwise in their lives. And we find them covering most effectively in the final poem, which shares its title with the collection, which they come for us. Here, when Asper claims his people as a king and observes, my country is made in my people's image, we must realize that we have lived beyond the familiar world of our familiar paradigms and epistemology. This is solitary, a mode of belonging and an affiliative constellation to here and now. It's a diaspora as far as recognizes a group across time and space, but this group is united not under a common point of dispersal, but under a common point of gathering. And this gathering takes place through an ethics of responsibility towards the other, an ethic whose primary locus is the arena of our of our, uh, locus is the arena of our imagination. We can call it after one critic a diaspora of imagination. For us, for this diaspora of our people, which is also a country for her, a country without borders, but grounded in belonging, gathers in the moment of being and becoming as the us, in quotation marks. Again, against this us is they, the they who come for the us. This is the they who shut its gates in the face of the us, who do not recognize the us as also human, and whose paranoia at the us's face incites us to violence. The us is neither essential nor absolute, for identity itself is constructive and shifting. 
it crystallizes at moments and most importantly it exhibits it it exists in the same matrix as the b and comes together when the i recognizes what judith butler calls the i eternal dependency on the u a recognition that is simultaneously again and lost as butler writes i cannot master the v except by finding the way in which i am tied to you by trying to translate but finding my own language must break up and me in defining the new you you are what i gain from this place of orientation and loss we find this as in various forms in all our four poets it coheres when the i recognizes recognizes its dependency and responsibility towards the you even when the you is itself not recognizable essential to this recognition recognition is a bleaching of various forms of borders and boundaries be it physical temporal civic uh, psychic or even communal and ethnic there are two prerequisites for this translation the first is a recognition itself and the second is imagination when the translation happens we form new alliances and affiliations resist injustice and ask for accountability for those whom we consider as ours in people to this translation is then a desire to deserve whether in person or in memory now freud tells us that the primary instinct of the i is to destroy the other and yet it is also true that the i by existing in the matrix of the human is always endowed with the capacity for what avishai margaret calls the microethics or the ethics of the individual an ethics that capables the i to also preserve to choose to preserve in this sense is then to make an ethical choice what is more when i ask for accountability for what has been done to you by recognizing you as mine i have already entered into an ethical bind with my own self by realizing my ethical duty towards you i began this paper with the question is there an ethic here in the post national world as borders and boundaries are growing more exclusion and hostility every day if we want an ethics an ethics of belonging it is to be found here in the moment of the i and the you in the moment when the i recognizes the you as also mine That was incredible. Thank you so much, Sushaban. That was brilliant.